Hello, everyone, and inside today's Locked On Canadians, what can the Habs learn from the Toronto Maple Leafs and their second round playoff exit? And we have so many mailbag questions. Connor Garland, who's the next Kirby Doc, and more inside today's show. Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 844 of On Canadians. We are your daily Montreal Canadian podcast, where you get your team wherever you get your daily podcast on your SiriusXM app, or if you're watching us on YouTube.com. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. I am one of your hosts. As always, I am Scott Mallon. I'm joined, as always, by my fantastic co-host, the active stick, Laura Saba. And Laura, we have a bit of gloating to do before we get to the actual mailbag questions today. But before that, how are you doing as we head into another week of, well, hoping something happens in Montreal? It's been a beautiful weekend in Montreal. And it started with the Toronto Maple Leafs losing, obviously. Uh, but it, it, we've been enjoying the weather. And it is like we're fully in draft mode, Scott. You and Ian did a fantastic job on the Friday episode with that mock draft. And most of our questions are draft related, actually. And we will get into bad questions before to not get to because we did the mock draft in that episode there. But first and foremost, as we set off the top of the show, the Toronto Maple Leafs lost in the second round, four games to one to the Florida Panthers, losing 3 2 in overtime. There was a weird Morgan Riley goal. No, mostly fans have seen that I have heard most sanely fans, the, the small, quiet minority of them, have agreed that you can't send a photo of the puck over the line. He stood up. That's not how this works. And my question is. From what feels like the 10th year in a row, it's not. It's, what, six or seven at this point. Toronto really hasn't hit what expectations they are. And the question now becomes, are there lessons the Canadians can learn from the Toronto Maple Leafs? Toronto bottomed out, got the first overall pick, obviously drafted Austin Matthews and changed the uh, trajectory of their franchise, going from laughing stock to laughing stock with star players on it. And I look at this team, they are built around four, five, depending on who you ask core players. You have Morgan Riley, John Tavares, Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, and William Nylander. Them are making double digit salaries. One of them is being run out of town by media. Almost any time something goes bad. And then there's Morgan Riley who the metronome is all over the place here. And the Canadians are entering an era where they're cleaning out the last remnants of the bad times, let's call them, the before times, the pre-Kent Hughes era times, and are going to start relying on their young stars, their Nick Suzuki's, their Kirby Docs, their hopefully soon to be re-signed Cole Caulfields. And I guess, Laura, my question is, what can the Canadians do besides, hey, don't get held hostage for $11 million for a winger who really didn't show up when it counted the most uh, and they were great round one, but round two Toronto stars outside of William Nylander and Morgan Riley were nowhere to be found in this series. I think there are multiple lessons. If you look over the course of the last few years, right? There's a couple of things that Toronto did right. One was bottoming out, obviously, and getting these extremely talented players. Two, they had a very, very strong farm team in the Marlies and they were able to ho not home grow home, develop that talent uh, which was fantastic. I think those things were really good ideas. But a couple of things that the Canadians, uh, sorry, not the Canadians, the Leafs, did not do right early enough is, one, they were too top-heavy, right? And that's, a th I think, a, a big thing that you have where when you are that top-heavy, you really need to balance out your cap. 
And that's not what they did. They tied up a lot of money in these extremely talented players, which are great. Like, they're fantastic players, but the opponents are going to shut those players down. That's who the opponent's going to target. So your depth has to be stronger. Your bottom six has to be stronger. Your defense has to be a lot more mobile and a lot better defensively. So they had a lot of problems over the course of the past few years. And they also had poor goaltending. They had poor coaching. And you have to have all of those things go right. You can have the best players in the world, and they have a few of the best players in the world. They have one of the best, if not the best, American player currently playing, um, not a woman, uh, who is also not a woman. Uh, they also have, you know, one of, like, I would say, like, one of the top Canadian players playing as well. Um, for those of you who are wondering who I was talking about, Hillary Knight, obviously. Um, <laughs> always have to mention Hillary Knight. But I'm just saying. You've got these players, you've got these fantastic forwards, you've got, you've got, and the thing with John Tavares is that he's extremely expensive, right? But he, it's not like he's a bum. He's just not worth the money that he's making right now. Like if this was 10 years ago, John Tavares, like he would be worth that money, right? So the, the problem that they have is that they're just too top heavy in cap. They're too top heavy on the ice and they did not have the adequate goaltending defense and coaching to make up for that or to not to make up for that, to buoy that, to like, you know, support that, to, to push that forward. So that was a mistake that they made. If from day one, if six or seven years ago, when was the first time they started losing to the, to the Boston Bruins in the first round? Like, what was that? 2013 was oh. what well, that was the it was 4-1 okay game. right so like um, so but, yeah so i mean you know since let's say since austin matthews really came into his own right 26 right so like let's say from then onwards that was the mistake that they made was that they the depth wasn't enough they didn't value their defensemen enough or they didn't value good defensemen enough they didn't get people who were able to uh, not only keep up with austin matthews keep up with the mitch martyrs to keep up with the Nylanders, but also to get those like to to be defensively to be to be defensive minded enough to sort of keep the puck out of the net but also transition the play get out of the zone you know and then they had they had who they, they had Mike Babcock they had Sheldon Keefe they did not have like a master tactician as much as you can look at Mike Babcock's uh career you look at the players that he was playing with the, the players he had at his disposal both in Detroit and on team Canada like anyone could win with that because those were balanced lineups, top to bottom, and, and with the goaltending. So he had everything at his disposal. In the absence of that, you need a master tactician. You don't need a guy that's going to motivate. Like people think that this is just in the Leafs' heads. There's a little bit of an element that it is in their heads. They are getting in their own way. They do trip all over their own selves. That's 100% true. But you need somebody who's going to be able to motivate them out of that, but also is a smart enough tactician to say, I have gener generational players up front. I'm going to do something with them. And I, I know that my defense isn't adequate. I'm going to figure out a way to play around their weaknesses to capitalize on the opportunities of the, of the other team. I'm going to make use of my Austin Matthews, my Mitch Marner, my Willie Nylander, uh, and my Morgan Riley. I think Morgan Riley is one of those players that's like overrated and underrated at the same time. And I look at this before we move on into our next segments here as I go, Sheldon Keefe got out coached in the playoffs. He was lucky to beat Tampa Bay where Toronto was better teams for parts of that, but Tampa Bay was unlucky to just not, that series could have been over in five games and Sheldon Keefe just looks lost. And the general pulse that I've gotten from Leaf fans, and this is something the Canadian should be very wary of, is that most Leaf fans are fine with Dubas and Shanahan coming back. They do not want to see Sheldon Keefe behind this bench anymore because I, I very clearly, they, it doesn't work. And for the Canadians, when you start getting ready to contend, if you're hitting a roadblock with Martin St. Louis, and it is not working, and there's someone out there who can get your team over that hump, do it. Uh, Laura, we had one final note before we go into our next segment. Yes, yeah, since we're talking about what the Canadians can learn from this, I think Martin St. Louis is that guy that will inspire you to run through a wall. He is magnificent at that. Every single player would lay down his life for Mar Martin St. Louis. But the Canadians need to have, grow, or sign a master tactician into that coaching roster if they're going to contend. Yes, and we will, I'm sure, touch on this more. Toronto's media availability is tomorrow. 
But it is Monday, and because Ian and I did the mock draft on Friday, we have pushed the mailbag to today. We have plenty of mailbag questions coming up in just one moment. But first, today's show is brought to you by Athletic Greens. And Athletic Greens is great because you take it first thing in the morning to help give you more energy to optimize the way you start the day. It's super healthy for you with 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food source superfoods in there. To start your day right, helps boost your immune system, energy, recovery, help with focus, fighting aging, all of those things. And it's lifestyle-friendly, so if you are vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, this can work for you. And it's just so simple. And every subscription comes with a year supply of vitamin D. So 7,000 five-star reviews. You cannot argue against that. And they're a climate-neutral certified company. Really important for that. So right now, it is the perfect time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water at the start of the day, and that's it. You don't need a million different pills and supplements to look out for your own health. And to make it even easier, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-sporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase, all you got to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash NHL network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. We are back here at Locked On Canadians. As always, if you have mailbag questions for us, you can tweet us at LO underscore Canadians on Twitter, LockedOnCanadians at gmail.com if you need a longer form to send us. And that is actually where a bunch of our mailbag questions are coming from today. Laura, we're starting off with a question about a Vancouver Canuck. It is not Brock Besser this time, (laughs) and it is not Quinn Hughes, unfortunately. What is in the mailbag to start us off on this Monday? So this is a really intriguing question that kind of we're going to do two questions in this segment because they're kind of related. Uh, One of them comes from our good friend uh, is Victor Maxwell, who asks us questions from time to time. Hey, how are you doing? Good day, Scott and Laura. Hope you're both doing great and enjoying the summer. It is beautiful out. Mailbag question. I saw a video from Lego Rocks on YouTube stating that the Vancouver Canucks may have to give up their first round pick to unload Connor Garland's contract until because it's 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 four point nine million dollars for the next three years. So keep that in mind. Should Kent Hughes jump at the chance at another NHL draft bank robbery considering where the Canucks are picking? Also, Connor Garland is not that bad a player. He scores upwards of 20 goals a season. So once again, $4.9 million for three years, for the next three years. And also, Scott, we he's 27 years old. Is that correct? Yes. So I am looking at Puckpedia. Not that I wouldn't usually use cap friendly, but there's has not rolled over, over to the next season yet. And the season, if I'm reading this correct, already are over the cap limit with the with the players that are on their roster. And due to be re-signed, Michael Furland retired, so he's done. Vitaly Kratsov, RFA, up in the air. Kyle Burrows, Noah Juleson, Travis Dermott, Ethan Bear, and Akito Hirose, and then also Colin Delia are all up for new contracts. And then next year, Elias Pettersson's due to get paid. Anthony Bovillia will be UFA. Tanner Pearson, if he ever plays again, will be out there. Uh, Vasily Podkolzin, Aiden McDonough, uh, Dakota Joshua, and a couple of other players will also be up for contracts. The Canucks need to fix this roster. Yeah, they will graduate some prospects, potentially a guy. Um, and I am forgetting this prospect's name, unfortunately, off the top of my head. So I apologize. Um, Jonathan Leckermaki coming over from Sweden will likely probably crack this lineup. And I look at Connor Garland and go, yeah, Absolutely. It's a longer term deal, so the Canadians need to be wary of that. It has three years left on it. And if I'm going to look at the Canucks here and I'm taking a look at their draft picks, they have a first this year, no second. They have one first, no second next year, and all their firsts in 2025 and beyond. I absolutely would say, yeah, I will take a first round pick from you just because I still do not know where the Vancouver Canucks are or what they think they are. And a guy like Connor Garland, I could see slides right into that middle six there and maybe makes it easier uh, for some of those younger guys. There some of those younger centers, Connor Garland and Kirby Doc. Would you play a potentially, let's say they get Leo Carlson with, with someone like Connor Garland. I'm not opposed to it, but before the Canadians take that on, 
they've got to shed a Hoffman, a Dvorak, an Edmondson or something to try and balance out that. And I think if the Canucks are that desperate, even if they eat salary, absolutely in a heartbeat. But there's a lot of roster spots already taken up, and the Canadians need to make some room in addition to that. But I would love a guy like Connor Garland, and the Canadians aren't going to be the only team in on that. There's a lot of teams with a lot of cap space, and Connor Garland could get a lot of teams a lot better very quickly. A team like Buffalo, a team like Anaheim, anything like that. Teams who have really turned – the corner or will be turning the corner in this upcoming season. And the thing to remember always is if the Canadians were to do something like this, and obviously if the Canucks had their first round pick thrown in, um, is that they would, they would still have to clear out a player or two uh, in order to make this happen. So you got to, you have to think about who the Canadians will clear out and who the Canadians would have to give up. Um, yes. and that's a big one. And so we've got another question from, that is kind of related because I think the reason that Victor Maxwell asked this question or brought it up is because, you know, Kirby Doc last year f- feels like a steal now in retrospect, right? It feels like a magnificent trade. So our friend Francis Tardif asks, who is the next Kirby Doc of this draft? In this draft class or to be traded for at the draft? To be traded for at the draft. And here, I'm going to put this to you, Scott. Doesn't necessarily have to be the Habs doing it. <sighs> Man, like I, I'm trying to think of like who is going to be out there, and honestly, it's not that Pierre Luc Dubois is going to move at some point here. I can almost guarantee that. I'm curious what happens in Calgary because now that Daryl Sutter is gone, players rescinded trade requests. Uh, I'm curious if JT Miller goes uh, New York, and we will talk about the Rangers in our final segment a little bit too. There's a lot of teams in cap spots that have to cut bait on players because they can't afford them. They can't afford that and a full roster. It is one or the other. Pierre-Luc Dubois seems like the obvious one because his name his name is going to be all over the place and it'll be more than just the Canadians because that's how this works. Um, I would not be surprised if Connor Garland ends up being that person though. Uh, or even someone like Brock Besser. I don't think Besser got traded, did he? I don't think Brock or am I thinking of the wrong guy? Either way, my thought is else. who is the other player that was um, a Vancouver Canuck that got traded this year and uh, Bo Horvat who got traded the Islanders. That's what I was thinking of, but like Brock Besser's I name was, was blanking in... on him too. I was about to say Travis Hamanick and I was like, he's in Ottawa. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I think someone like Bo a Horvath. Brock Besser may go too, just because they are real tight against the, they're over the cap. And they're going to have to cut bait if they want to do things here. But you never know until it happens. We didn't know Kirby Doc was going to get traded. We know Alex DeBrincat was at the around that time. We did not know Kirby Doc was going to, and then it happened. And we don't know what's going to happen in Toronto. We don't know what's going to happen in Edmonton if they lose to uh, Vegas tonight. The game's still two and a half hours away, so we're not staying up to record after that. A lot of different things can happen in real short order here, and it all depends on what teams are going to grossly overreact to what happened and which ones aren't. And speaking of teams grossly overreacting to things, we do have some questions about the New York Rangers and one of their former first overall picks. And we will get into that in our next segment. But as we mentioned off the top of the show, today's show is brought to you by game time. And if you're like us, your sports fans, your movie fans, your theater fans, your concert fans, it can be so hard to get tickets and it can be such a stressful experience But let me tell you about game time to take all the stress out of that because you can get flash deal and last minute ticket sales for any event in your city. It's easy to find and buy tickets on there. You can get image of your seat to you. So before you spend that money, you know exactly what you are getting and they have the lowest price guarantee and event cancellation protection. And if you lost your job and you can't pay for it, they have protection for that too. So forget planning months in advance. Weather's nice. You want to go see a baseball game. You want to go see a Jays game in Toronto. You want to go see, you know, a Red Sox game in Boston. You can do that here. And all you got to do, download the Game Time app. You create an account. Use code Lockdown NHL. Get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply to that. But again, create an account. Redeem code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your order. And just remember, download Game Time today. It's the last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. 
We are back here at Locked On Canadians, and as always, we do a mailbag once a week. This time is at the beginning of the week. We will do it at the end of the week. If you have mailbag questions, at LO underscore Canadians on Twitter. Also follow us. Sometimes we're very funny. And LockedOnCanadians at gmail.com if you've got a lot that you want to say or want answered within reason, of course. Laura, what do we have to wrap up the mailbag today? So our good friend Robert Rice says, and usually we do email questions at the beginning. Today we're doing email questions at the very end, but this one's a Twitter one from our good friend Robert Rice. Has everyone lost perspective on Mitchkov having to play three more years in the KHL? Pittsburgh had to wait two years for Malkin, and one can hardly imagine a third year being a deal breaker at that time. I think everyone's lost perspective on this. I I don't want to say lost perspective, but everyone has a varying opinion on this. And because admittedly, some people want the new shiny thing immediately. And I totally get that. I totally understand. I remember the countdown waiting for Cole Caulfield. We're going to go through this with Lane Hudson. I understand why there is that. I want to see them tangibly as soon as possible. Three years is a long time. But I, if we look at the Canadians logically in a long-term scope here, on this timeline in three years should be when they are starting to hit the peak of their contendership window, or at least be on the outside looking in. And then you can add Mitchkov to that. I think that's a big thing, but I also understand the Canadians might want to be ready to go soon. They maybe not in the playoffs this year, but they're kind of sneaking up the standings a little bit. And then they're ready within two years. And if you have a Will Smith, a Leo Carlson, a whomever in your lineup already, you are ahead of the game. So I don't think people have lost perspective. I just think a lot of people have varying views on what their rebuilding timeline looks like right now. I cannot disagree with you on that one. Uh, And then we've got another question from a Johnny on Twitter. Good friend who's been a longtime listener. And we really appreciate you, Johnny. Uh, considering the Rangers will be extremely cap strapped this summer, could the Canadians offer sheet Lafreniere for one year at 4.2 million, risking only a second round pick in the process? Or could this threat be enough for the Blue Shirts to consider moving him for Florida's pick? Now, I want to stress that before this question, that at the time this question was asked, it was before we knew that Florida was picking 28th to 32nd, depending on how it shakes out. At that time, we didn't know if it was going to be 17th or way later, but still worth worth asking the question, like, would the Blue Shirts consider moving him to the Canadians for something in return? I look at them right now. They have three big pending UFAs that were part of this team. Patrick Kane, Vladimir Tarasenko, Tyler Mott on defense, Nico Mikola, and then also Keandre Miller is due for a contract. The thing about Lafreniere is he, because I think someone asked about Capo Caco, and maybe Ian and I touched on this a little bit, and I'm already forgetting. Lafreniere hasn't kind of hit those lofty goals. I don't know if it's just a Rangers thing, a coaching thing. But there's something there that isn't clicking. And I don't want this to become the next Pierre-Luc Dubois situation because we're already kind of tired of it being the Pierre-Luc Dubois situation right now. I can understand why Jeff Gordon might want to do this. But at the same time, it's a it's even more pressure to be than have Lafreniere coming back to his home province, a former first, ro- first overall pick, no less, and then trying to fit in on a team that is rebuilding. The Rangers were rebuilding, and he went there, and there's a lot of pressure. He's going to go to Montreal, the birth, you know, the mecca of the hockey world. I'm only passing on this just because $4.2 million is not a lot for, or is a lot for, I want to take a look at his numbers here, but I, I want to say he had 39 points last year in 81 games. I want to say Cole Caulfield outscored him and he didn't play for the back half of the season there because of his shoulder injury. Caulfield had 36 points in 46 games. I don't know if that's what I would do for $4.2 million. I would, you know, cheer for success if it does, but it's probably not high on my list right now at this point. So our other questions are uh, in our, like in emails. So I'm going to read out the first one. Uh, Sorry. (laughs) 
I went back to look for them. So we've got a couple from, all right, we've got JS who is uh, always, you know, who's, who's always sending us really, really good, intriguing questions. Uh, hey, Laura. Hey, Scott. Now that the Habs know they are for sure picking fifth overall and people are flooding the internet with their opinions on who they believe Kent Hughes will pick, I'm with Scott here, swing for the fences and draft Mitch Kov at fifth if he's available. What should the Habs do with Florida's pick? As that pick continues to slide, with Florida looking very dominant at, at the moment, I feel like that opens the possibilities for Hughes and Gordon to get more creative. Something like moving the Florida pick and maybe a prospect like Norlinder, Mayu, Kidney, or Tuck, for example, and or an established player like Big Ed, I'm assuming that means Joel Edmondson, Hoffman, Armia, to move up again in the draft to maybe land a player like Gabriel Perot, Quentin Musty, Ethan Gauthier, or my personal favorite as a London Knights fan, Oliver Bonk. These could be <laughs> huge moves. What would you think? of a move like that i'd also love some other creative ideas from you both or from some other listeners all right listeners jay has challenged you <laughs> um so listen to this send and, us and... your insane trade proposals we will no, read they... them on here because they're fun they have to be creative though they can't just be like insane as in like i just thought of the most outlandish thing ever they have to be creative i like they this. can be this a little, they can be a little insane as a treat <laughs> you can have a little insanity <laughs> as a treat <laughs> so i actually like that idea of packaging to move up and you know swing for to someone like samuel hanzek fall does does gabriel pro fit that spot there who's going to be the one that falls out of that top 10 15 range there i like it uh someone also suggested just trade the florida pick straight up for carter hart and i went i don't know if philly would do that but i don't not know that philly would do that so solve two problems at once and get a goalie uh, I think that the Florida pick is uh, is on the block at this point to move up or to get a current player they want to add to this team. It's at 26th right now, and I don't care if Florida gets swept. They're, the 26th pick is where it is. Obviously, that's where they got Philip Mashar last year, and Philip Mashar was an insanely talented player and still is, despite what other people are saying on the internet. Do not give up on your prospects. I am okay with seeing where it lands with Florida's playoff run here and then working out the packages afterwards, just because I do think it would be smart to try and move up. Yeah. You have a lot of prospects in the pool and you want to have as many cracks as the apple there, but if you can move up and get a Quentin musty, a uh, Gavin Brindley, even if Colby Barlow falls down there, you have options available to you. All right, we've got a couple more email questions. And if I could work email, <laughs> we've got Bill Van V. I'm wondering your thoughts on the possibility of the Habs drafting a goalie relatively high in the upcoming drafts, say in rounds two or three. I'm even open to the possibility of the team doubling up on the position and drafting two goalies this draft. I know Jakob Dobish had a good year and Frederick Dishow has some promise, but I feel goaltending is a position that has not been given the priority it should have since Carey Price was drafted. I'm not a draft expert, but I am curious if you think taking a player like Trey Augustine or uh, Michael Hrabel Hrabel in round two or three uh, and perhaps someone else with a later pick, pick would be advisable. I would love a quality homegrown goalie to solidify the future. What are your thoughts? And this is from Bill Van B, who's been a Habs fan for 48 years. Wow, you've been a Habs fan for even much longer than I've existed, and I'm not that young. Uh, I We talked to Sebastian High about this, and there's some talent in this. Uh, Ian and I talked a little bit about goaltenders in because he drafted a goalie in his mock draft there. I'm not opposed to it. If the right guy is there, go for it. Uh, admittedly, goalies are a little bit voodoo, so and I'm not going to pretend to know how to analyze junior goalies or anything like that. But you are not incorrect in saying it's a position that is a little bit of a need. The Canadians do not have their goalie of the future in the system right now. We will see how Dobish does in the AHL next year, but Caden Primo is potentially what he is right now. Samuel Montembeau, we know, is a good tandem goalie right now. They do not have a Spencer Knight, a even like Joseph Wool, who came out of the AHL for the Leafs against Florida there and played well, even in the losses. They do not have that guy in their system right now. And that's just the truth. I'm not opposed to it. I wouldn't go first round pick on a goalie, but late second, maybe if they get, acquire one somewhere, third round pick if there's a guy there absolutely all for it it's something i could see 
Uh, Laura, we got time for one more out of the email, I think. And that's all we would have for this uh, uh, for this episode. Like these will be all the mailback questions. This is this comes from our good friend Richard the Architect. Um, hi, Richard. I don't know if you guys noticed this as well at the at the draft lottery on Sportsnet. I believe it also happened on ESPN. Right after the San Jose pick, they went for a commercial break. As they were going for a commercial break, they made a comment about the first slip of the draft. Here's the thing: that draw hadn't happened yet. Prior to that commercial break, they stated Columbus had fallen to the three, but we'd only just learned the fourth spot. I could be wrong in believing this lottery was live, but that was unequivocal evidence that it wasn't, and something about that doesn't seem right to me. It also seems fishy with all the background stuff going in Chicago, right when they need something to provide a happy focus, right where they ship off all their stars that they just so happen to jump two spots and win the lottery in a year where there's a generational star available. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and I'm definitely not sad about where the Habs are picking, but something just seems off. But the actual mailback question, assuming the Habs pull another doc trade at the draft or not, who are your top three draft candidates not named, or sorry, doc candidates not named Kako, <laughs> Lafreniere, or Zadina? So about the the draft, the so the draft takes place like before the show, and the I lottery, believe Frank, yeah, yeah the, sorry, the lottery part, the picking part, um, it happened in front of us for the I think the year of the pandemic, like in 2020. But then in general, what happens is that it's like watched by like Ernst and Young or whoever, like one one of those. Like I think Ernst and Young is the is the Golden Globes or whatever it is. Anyway, so it gets watched. Um, and Frank Saravelli was apparently sequestered where the lottery was taking place. So, like, the league knows what the order is, but nobody else is supposed to know. So, there is something fishy in that somebody's talking. So, obviously, the, the TV people know before we find out. But the idea is that, like, other than, like, Bill Daly and Bettman and whatever, we're not supposed to know until it gets revealed. And, and, and journalists are supposed to not know until it gets revealed. So, that's that's where it is. Like... The reason I think is that they would leak it otherwise. And that's why Frank Cervelli was sequestered. He wasn't allowed out uh, because he would leak it for sure. And you know he would. But yes, so the lottery is not live. Um, the results are revealed after. The only time it was live was when it was the pandemic year, the Lafreniere year. Um, sorry, Scott, you were about to say something. The whole thing about that is it's not that it was rigged. It's that they just screwed up their production of it and no one decided to fix it because it was probably recorded beforehand. And they just didn't fix it at all, which is just the NHL to a T is that here's this very simple thing we have to do. We will not do said thing. It's not rigged because the NHL isn't competent enough to rig its own draft lottery. They couldn't possibly do that. It's uh, the whole Chicago thing is gross. I understand why people feel that way, but I do not think uh, this was rigged. I think it was just the NHL is just, you know, they're, they're not smart enough to rig their own lottery. It's like, just like people who think they're fixing the playoffs with the officials. They can't host a draft lottery without spoiling it for themselves. They can't do simple things right without tripping over their own two feet. They're not rigging anything. Occam's razor is the simplest solution is likely the easiest answer for this. Uh, as for the doc candidates, the Connor Garland one is now going to linger in the back of my head a little bit. I still think Pierre-Luc Dubois is going to be that guy. There's something out there that we haven't hit yet just because teams are still going through their own post-mortems internally. I wouldn't be shocked within the next week if we start hearing more potential things coming out of the woodworks here, and then we can kind of reassess this in a little bit. But for right now, Pierre-Luc Dubois is spots one through three on that. It just makes way too much sense for the Canadians. And Christian Dvorak could be that guy for another team, to be quite honest. Uh, if the Canadians are going to make that move, but we will see what comes of that. We are going to wrap the show here. We will be back recording Monday night, plenty more content for y'all as we continue through play reviews, draft stuff, rumblings and whatnot. Make sure you're following us on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians. We are available wherever you get your daily podcast or on YouTube. Make sure you're subscribed there. Follow my co-host at the active stick and follow myself at Scott Matla. And as always, thank you so much for listening, and we will see you all next time.